Um, so I am Will Fenton. I am the Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Uh, many of you I see are familiar with our institution. Uh, the quickest way I can explain it, founded by Franklin, 1731, as the first subscription library. Um, and uh, over the past almost 300 years, we've changed a bit. Now we're a research library, and we support all sorts of tremendous research fellows, like the one you'll hear from tonight, who use our collections and bring them to life in articles and books and digital projects that we're very excited to support. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, which I think I started to mention. Um, your camera is not enabled, so you can just sit back and relax, uh, but there are other ways for you to interact with this. Uh, we have a Q&A button, and I encourage you, as you're listening to this talk, if you hear something that you're interested in or that you wanna hear more about or that you wanna push back against, put it in the Q&A, and I will do my very best to get through all of the questions, and I will apologize profusely if that's not possible. Um, I will be, if I think of anything, I'll share other resources. So, you know, if, for example, a book gets mentioned or an article that I can quickly look up, I will drop a link in the chat. Um, and don't worry about necessarily clicking on that. We want you to be able to enjoy this experience. So there will be a follow-up email within a week when we send out a link to the recording of this, um, of this fireside chat, uh, which will be made available on both our YouTube uh, um, feed and also our SoundCloud account. So if you're looking for a way to share this with somebody who maybe couldn't make it on a seven o'clock on a, on a Thursday night, this is another way that they can enjoy uh, uh, the wisdom that we'll hear from Steve Bullock. Um, finally, I always like to include a uh, call to action and uh, that's a very simple one. If you go on librarycompany.org, our homepage, you scroll down to the bottom, if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter. Um, we have an e-newsletter that goes out once a month, and that's a great way to find out about all the other events that we put out. For example, we just finished a, a really tremendous uh, seminar on racism and infectious disease. We have lots more planned for the fall. Um, of course, everything will be online, which also means that it'll be through Zoom just like this. But the benefit to that is that everything will be made widely available, and that's something that we really believe in at the library company. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter this evening. Dr. Stephen C. Bullock is professor of history at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. His books include Tea Sets and Tyranny, The Politics of Politeness in Early America, and Revolutionary Brotherhood, Freemasonry and the Transformation of the American Social Order, 1730 to 1840. Winner of WPI's Award for Outstanding Research and Creative Scholarship, he's served as a Fulbright lecturer in Japan very envious. Uh, he was also published in Newsday and the Wall Street Journal and appeared on ABC, CNN, NPR, and in documentaries that have aired on PBS, the History Channel, and elsewhere. Dr. Bullock was the Reese Fellow in American Bibliography at the Library Company in 2017. Welcome, Steve. Good evening. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to, um, I'm going to start my slideshow here. Um, and I'm so honored to be to be part of this. Um, not only because so many other really significant and interesting scholars have have, have done this and will be doing it, um, but also because of my deep love for the library company. It was, you know, I had a great time, and I'm shocked to hear it was three years three years ago um, that it actually happened. So I have to figure out a way to get back. And, because I had a wonderful time and it, um, it and its sister institution next door, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania is, is the sort of greatest place anyone can go to study this topic. So um, it fits well in with the, with the theme of this. Um, and as you can see, my, my title is How Person Weems Remade George Washington and Made the 19th Century. So let me explain to you a little bit about what that means. I'm going to try to um, talk about the big picture here. So there may be things um, that remain unexplained that I'll be happy to try to explain in the, in the, in the questions. Um, but I wanted to get you some sense of, the, of what I think is the big story here, and um, not only about the 19th century, but also about Weems and his experience with, uh, with George Washington and with uh, Matthew Carey, the printer whose papers are 
at the Historical Society. So let me start though with something. Um, let me start with something here from The Simpsons, obviously. Um, this, is, um, this is an image that I've been using sort of as my Zoom avatar while we've been, while we've been confined for the past few months, um, probably attempting to provide some measure of me looking as if I have, I'm a little dangerous, uh, which I'm not particularly. Um, but it also um, fits right in with my, my interest in, um, in George Washington and the revolution, but also with Parson Weems because as you, as you may well know, the story of George Washington and the cherry tree, the, probably the story that almost everyone who was raised in America knows and would learned as a child even. Um, that story comes from Parson Weems' biography of George Washington what comes to be called the life of George Washington. Um, and, and, so I, and so I'm trying to figure out what's going on there. Why is this such an important story? What does Williams have to do with it? And how does that develop? Um, um, and today, even though, um, even, though a lot this, even though his book has allowed the Simpsons to sort of portray Washington as sort of an ax murderer, um, Weems today seems sort of largely harmless. Um, um, at worst, people see him as um, overly moralistic, as somebody who makes things up, um, but doesn't seem to be a, a sort of a dangerous kind of person, much as uh, maybe I'm trying to make, as I was suggesting, I'm trying to make myself out to be. Um, the, um, the, the august sort of papers of George Washington, this, that extraordinary institution trying to track down everything George Washington said and get it down as precisely as possible, um, is willing to take George Washington's biography, uh, which is um, often kind of incorrect in things, but willing to call it simply just storybook George. This is storybook George, um, Wikipedia, for a, for a book which is one of the great books of the 19th century, one of the most widely reprinted, read, and known books of the entire century. Wikipedia doesn't even have an article about this. Um, and I noticed just this week that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that Parson Weems, Mason Lock Weems, actually now is, um, uh, has broken free of its origins in the in the series folklore and tall tales, so that's the that's the Weems we sort of think about today, and, and scholars sort of tend to know about Weems, but just a little bit, sort of see him as a as a backwoods sort of book peddler, uh, somebody who is uh, who is a liar, a manipulator, um, and there's something to that. I, you know, Weems is um, Weems is not. Um, careful with his facts. Um, he is, um, he has, uses purple prose sort of regularly. Um, he's moralistic. All, everything he does is designed to teach morality. Um, but I think today he doesn't seem like as that significant a figure. But a but hundred years ago, in the early 20th century, Weems was much harder to ignore. Um, um, many, many cultural critics were you know, well critical about it. The, the, the prominent, prominent historian writes a biography of Washington in 1922 um, and calls Weems' biography not just a drivel, which is bad enough in itself, but he says this is pernicious drivel. Pernicious drivel. Uh, Vachel Lindsay, who was a modernist poet, a, a sort of significant figure in the, um, in the, in the, um, the aesthetic life of the, of the 1920s um, um, is, is positively outraged with, with Weems. He calls him possibly the greatest liar the world has ever known, and reserving only the devil as perhaps worse than Weems. Um, and Weems to Lindsay seemed the, the nation's lawgiver, a person whose work had infected the nation's grassroots had sort of destroyed its moral fiber, had, had, had led to America's rotting pieties, its sniffy priggishness, its appalling complacency and cheap hypocrisy. 
And Lindsay warned, Weems is in you like the alphabet. He is in you like the alphabet. I think meaning, you know, it's, it's part of the way we think. It's part of the way that Americans at that point were, um, were, able to, were able to make sense out of the world, part of the very structures of thought. Um, and sort of surprisingly, even, even outside of these very critical people, um, other people were, were um, no less aware of Weems's power. A, a popular historian, somebody who writes, wrote for the public at that point, wrote in the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, other great Philadelphia institution. In 1912, he said, Weems is, as far as historians go, the person that um, is far beyond any other historian America has ever produced in actually being read and being influential. He said, um, Weems has been read a hundred times more than all the other histories and biographies of the revolution put together. It was a pretty extraordinary kind of thing. And you'd think that'd be about as strong as you can get, but a year later, there's actually a newspaper article um, which claims that the cherry tree story was actually read in America more than any other story ever, except for the Bible. So as a cultural historian, you know, this is catnip to me. You know, this is the um, a stories which are, which are more than any other thing, except Bible stories of a person seen as a liar who is worse than anybody except for the devil. You know, this is, makes me wanna know about who this guy is, what's, what's going on there. So I think he's well worth paying attention to. And so this is my project. I'm writing a, a book about, Washington, about Weems and his biography of Washington, um, which as, as suggested, is a really significant book of the 18th century. Uh, undoubtedly the most popular biography of the early 1800s. Um, and to give you some sense of what I'm talking about here, um, talking about the number of editions, the number of reprintings. Um, it is reprinted 17 times in the 18 teens, nine times in the 1820s, 11 times in the 1830s, and 14 in the 1840s and 50s. And in fact, in, in, in studying this, I've sort of become convinced that some of those, that those early 20th century writers um, were at least partly correct, that Weems is not simply a a sort of a, an oddity, not simply a, a mirror of the of the 19th century, that it has a that has a significant role in making the 19th century, and and sort of helping to spread and encourage the ways of thinking that loom so large to the 19th century, and especially the people like Lindsay, who in the early 20th century are attempting to change the culture, attempting to make things um, different and. Um, create a different kind of world. You can see simply by looking at him, um, thinking about what George Washington looked like. Um, um, in, in my book, particularly, I'm interested in the way the, the, that the biography of Washington, Weems's biography, um, develops over the decade that it was being rewritten, written, and then rewritten from 1799, when it's first conceived, to 1809, when its final version is finally created. Um, so I'm writing what I sometimes call a biography of the biography. And of course, sort of by necessity, I'm also writing a biography of the biographer as well. So, but of course, as you can already see, you know, I'm, I'm doing some, trying to look more large, um, trying to look more widely as well, trying to examine the broader culture that gave birth to, uh, to Weems and his book and that, that the two of them together, the, the author and the book sort of changed over time. So, um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Talk about the origins of the life of Washington and Weems himself. And then I wanna look a little bit about how the book developed over the course of, of a decade in which Weems remade himself as well as remade his book. And finally, um, if, I have, if I have time, I wanna look a little bit at the influence of the book. So looking how it, um, it helped um, remake that culture, um, even influencing um, um, Abraham Lincoln himself, one of the, the great figures of the 19th century. So let's get right to it. Let's get to the origins of the biography and the biography. So this is the, um, this is the first edition of, of what becomes the life of George Washington. Um, 
produced in, in January 1800, so the very beginning of the century. Um, he is there, and as you can see, it's a rather unassuming volume. Um, it's a small book, um, cheaply produced. Um, Jim Green, who the, the, um, the, one of the great figures in the library company, um, um, tells me, in fact, that this, is a, that this is a form of printing which is usually used for wallpaper. So this is not a high prestige kind of book. This is designed to be sold to everyday people. And here you can see the, you can see the cheap paper, the, um, the rather uninspired print uh, as the frontispiece there, the life and memorable actions of George Washington. Um, and this book, um, you know, pretty extraordinarily for Weems, um, is, appears just at the right time. Uh, but it, it, it is published in the wake of the death of George Washington, who dies unexpectedly in mid-December, 1799, um, at a time when Washington is still the most widely known, most widely respected American, um, sort of ever, actually, at this point. So, um, and there's an extraordinary outpouring of of grief and of commemoration, of praise for Washington. Oh, um, over 400 orations are given across the country. Hundreds of these are published. Um, but out of that, Weems's Life of George Washington is the only part of that that still remains in print, that is still recalled there. Um, the only other thing that even um, is remembered in any way is Henry Lee's um, congressional speech, where he calls Washington first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Um, and that's not surprising in a way. Lee in 1800 is a member of Congress. Um, he is a member of one of the key families of Virginia. He is a hero of the Revolutionary War. So it's not surprising that he's sort of still a figure. But Weems in 1800, it's kind of shocking that he's the one that, that ends up being so successful because um, he doesn't even seem to have been prominent enough to be asked to give a commemorative address. So not even the top 400, you see, is sort of make it. And he's, he is sort of entering middle age, still as nobody. Uh, by 1800, he had experienced very little success, had left very little mark on the world. Um, in 1799, in the fall, he had turned 40 years old. Um, and for the past sort of four, four or five or six years, he had regularly been on the verge of failing in his third profession in the book business. Um, his employer, sort of semi-partner, um, was in continual danger of financial failure. And neither of them, for a good deal of time, seemed very excited about working together, even if everything were to continue. Um, Weems, at this point, had been a publisher on his own for a decade published only a couple books a year, um, including uh, this book, which I also saw at the library company, the, the Holy Bible Abridged, which I think is a kind of extraordinary kind of title. Um, and Weems had had some success selling books, um, but while he had eloquently sort of celebrated the works of other people, he had not written much himself. Uh, before 1799, he'd published a little bit of the original writing in an almanac, Maybe, maybe 40 pages the most. Um, he had adapted a book on success. Um, 1799, he publishes a, a 30 page pamphlet um, um, on the sort of totally irrelevant topic today of political harmony, uh, which he talks about. The title is he's, he's offering political love powder. Um, and Weems is having trouble supporting his family at this point. Um, early 1800, he writes to um, his employer said, you know, this is terrible. I've, you know, you've treated me so poorly. I'd be dependent on public charity if I hadn't sort of gone back to working um, as something outside of the book business. And the following months, he suggests, I'm standing on the threshold of poverty. Um, and Weems was not successful, in fact, because he hadn't tried. Um, he was born 1759, as I said, 27 years after Washington. So sort of another whole other generation passed him. Um, the son, just like Washington himself, of a Chesapeake tobacco farmer. Um, 
Weems, though, on the east, Maryland's eastern shore, just north of Annapolis. Um, and just like Washington's father, Weems's father is moderately well-to-do, sort of a significant um, person within the county, but having little significant out, outside of that. Uh, and to make things worse for, for Weems, just like Washington, Weems was a younger son, the third surviving son in both cases. Both of them experienced the early death of their father, and both of them ex got very little, um, very little um, to show for the death of their of their fathers. The um, Washington, of course, famously received some some land and and a, and some enslaved people. Weems doesn't seem to have gotten any land at all um, there and. Um, and again, like Washington, um, Weems sets his enslaved people free, um, but at, at Weems actually doing it right, right at that point, it seems. Uh, he boasts later on, I, I was an early liberator of my slaves. Um, but Weems is also able to get an education in a way that, we, that Washington wasn't, some sort of literary background, um, unlike the sort of traditional um, basic schooling that George Washington gets. And, and Weems, of course, has to make his way uh, beyond the farm there. And he starts off first as a doctor. Um, he arrives in 1782 um, in, in France, and people talk about his Dr. Mason Weems, uh, proclaim that he wants to go and study at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which he may well do. Um, but within two years, he's decided he wants to become minister. So he's decided to seek ordination in the Church of England, which is a, which as a United States citizen, he was not able to do at that point. He's actually the, um, the first American to be, actually become a member, uh, clergyman of the Church of England. Unfortunately, he arrives back in, in America to discover people don't like him as a minister. He um, becomes rector of All Hallows Church, which is the church um, you can see here, not a not enormously large or prepossessing kind of place. Um, and in fact, the whole western, the whole eastern shore is not doing that well. And the church has particularly been sort of um, had an awful time because of the um, the loss of public support for for religions. And and Weems doesn't turn out to be very popular. He leaves his first parish in 1789 spends another year before I can find even a temporary position. Uh, but at this point, some of Weems' most prominent characteristics are already visible, or at least his, his most prominent characteristics is extraordinary energy, his zeal and industry. Excuse me, I'm gonna get here. Um, 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 Weems, one of Weems' minister friends, uh, 1799, writes that, that he's amazed that Weems drives Jehu-like, referring to the biblical figure who driveth furiously, or as a modern translation suggests, like a maniac. Um, so Weems leaves the parish ministry in 1792, or was pushed out and turns to becoming what he calls a bibliopolist, somebody involved with the, with the business of books, publishing, editing, selling, but not being very successful. Um, until he actually comes into contact with Matthew Carey, who was a who was a major figure in the publishing world in Philadelphia, um, and be, it's beginning an alliance between sort of two of the most um, energetic and creative figures in the in the book business of the period, and and over the course, particularly the seventeen aughts, uh, the decade. Um, Carey becomes sort of the greatest publisher in, in, early, in the early public, um, selling inexpensive Bibles in a way that other people have not yet been able to do, uh, publishing maps on a new kind of scale. The, um, the, the great 19th century novel, Charlotte Temple, is sort of one of his books. And in 1808, as we're going to see, he becomes the publisher of The Life of Washington. Um, these two guys get along well at first. They have, they're the same age, exactly the same year. Um, the same unsinkable faith in books and in ideas, and both of them love to love to be verbal, love to write things. Um, um, and so, by 1796, Weems is traveling around looking, selling sort of prestige books for for Carey. Um, here's the system of modern geography. You can sort of see what a fancy, extraordinary book. Um, and this is the 
law library at the College of William and Mary, which still has the record of being bought, quite probably um, being um, sold by Weems there. The, um, but it's a big challenge to do this sort of thing, to send out somebody to, to travel from place to place to try to sell things. And Carrie doesn't really know how to handle that as well. Um, and, and what happens is the two come, come to blows um, figuratively and verbally uh, pretty quickly. They're, they're, they're like many marriages, sort of partly complementary, partly sort of brings different strengths to them, but also that quite often leading to them being at odds. Weems is the, is the people person, um, Carrie the numbers person. Weems is sort of the, the zealous salesperson, Carrie is the careful accountant there. So, so they need each other, but yet they're frustrated. Um, Carrie, my connection with you, he says 10 years even afterwards, my connection with you from the, from the earliest contact has been a source of chagrin, vexation, and loss. Um, so it's kind of an extraordinary thing. Um, Williams is a little more crude at this. He says, I've had a hell of a time in your service. That's certain. Um, and, but Williams is just deeply frustrated. Carrie keeps sending books that he doesn't know, that he knows can't be sold. And Williams knows that he knows what's what the way um, that people want things, but yet he is he is forced to sell these books that Carrie is sending him. And he's frustrated. He said, "You've annihilated five years of my life. You treated me like a dog, a mere slave." Um, and, and I think it's, it's that frustration which plays into Weems deciding he's going to publish his own book. He's going to have something which he can sell on his own and hold on to. And I think that's part of it. Um, but he also is recognizing, as I said, what, what books are selling, all those kind of things. And that's an other element of things. He is, his thinking is sort of plays out within the, the biography, the idea that revolutionary heroes are what people want to read about, the idea that pe books should be cheap, that they should be reach out to people. Um, he speaks about ad captundum books, excuse my Latin pronunciation there, essentially seeking to capture attention, to reach out to common people there. Um, and he also wanted, he also wanted to, to, to encourage people to be better, to encourage the community. Um, he's a deeply idealistic kind of man, and, and he is using that, the book, he's using Washington to do that. He also has a deepening connection with George Washington. Um, since 1795, he sort of made his home base in Virginia, Mary's a Northern Virginia um, woman, um, somebody who's connected with, um, whose family's connected to Dolly Madison, um, somebody who's uh, the father had been a classmate of Thomas Jefferson, um, and in 1799 he decides he is close enough to um, to Mount Vernon to to try to go out and collect anecdotes of Washington, and that's what leads to the leads to the um, to the life there. Um, he's also helped because George Washington reads some of those early books and writes to him about how how much he appreciates them. Something which. Um, Washington turns out does not do all that regularly. He gets lots of books and he often says, thank you, I appreciate it, but these are, these are stronger than that. These are something more. So, um, and so Weems in early 17, in early 1800s ready to do this. And he asks um, Kerry to help um, finance some of it, but he can't even wait for Kerry to respond. He publishes it himself and is almost immediately um, successful, and within a month or so, you had the second, the second edition already there, and and two more editions actually appear in 1800 each time, selling out there. So, uh, so that's that's the origins. Let me just move quickly here. I see we're um, we're you know, I'm using a lot more time than I expected. Um, let me just sketch out for you the um, some of the elements of this development. Um, uh, because for many books, you publish this uh, four times and that's sort of the end of the story. More, now the question is, what do people respond? But that's not the case. Um, in fact, these two first two versions I've shown you title pages of are actually quite different. Uh, and over the course of the years, until 1809, Weems takes almost every time Washington's life is printed, he revises it. And it appears like 18 different editions, nine different printers, 
four different titles ranging from 68 pages to 240 pages. So this is the book Washington Weems is working on for the longest time. He is, he is he's dealing with it at the same time. He is, his life is turning upside down. He is changing things. He is developing and developing a new kind of level of success. Um, um, in some ways, um, you have this, you know, this scrambled period of things when, when he breaks with Carrie, frustrated with things, um, he, he decides he's just not even going to try to deal with um, Carrie any longer. And in fact, you go for more than a year when they don't write. And then almost a year later, they, they don't write for another year. So they are, um, they are breaking apart. And the option for Weems is actually involves, shockingly, sort of Washington. Because Weems gets involved with publishing the authorized biography of Washington, the um, um, Washington's heir um, um, gets John Marshall to, um, to write a biography. Uh, they're a five volume kind of huge set um, that requires enormous kind of involvement of, of, of you have two full-time salespeople going around trying to get subscriptions for it. And Weems does the, does the South and is quite successful there, even though the book never gets sells as much as, as, as had originally been hoped for. But this is appealing for, for Weems as well, because he's working with a young publisher, somebody he thinks he can mentor, he can change things. Um, um, and over the course of these years, Weems um, grows, develops. He, he, um, he, he refines his marketing tactics. He begins to, he travels on an enormous kind of rate. This is, a, this is actually a, um, an American atlas by Kerry himself. But I put in Weems' travel over the course of 1804, um, starting in Northern Virginia, going down to Charleston all the way to Augusta um, uh, by way of Savannah and, um, and all sorts of ways. You can see all the different arrows, the way in which Weems is not simply sort of going from one place to the next and then going back. He is traveling from place to place looking for um, doing. And this year, it seems that he travels some, some 2,000 miles uh, the course of time, which um, which you might compare to Lewis and Clark, that great expedition, which leaves the same year. Um, they're only traveling on average 3,000 miles a year. So Weems is doing something kind of extraordinary there. And what he's trying to do is trying to look for places where people meet for public times and places, um, court sessions. Here's, this is a later um, image of a court day in a, in a country town in um, Lexington, Kentucky. Um, there's circuit courts. He traveled around. He went to legislative sessions to speak to legislatures. He went to camp meetings to um, uh, provide other opportunities. Um, if you hear, um, if you hear next week's um, um, discussion of a, of a camp meeting minister, where um, you sort of Seth Perry and I are talking about whether Weems and and his character actually met, met at a camp meeting, would have met at a camp meeting there. Um, but, but Weems is going around all sorts of different places. He's making connections. He is making himself um, extraordinarily popular, um, speaking almost everywhere he can, um, giving, oration, giving an oration to both houses of the New Jersey legislature, speaking in the South Carolina Capitol in 1807, a sermon, um, preaching, preaching in the United States Capitol later on in 1813 and speaking at the graduation of the University of Georgia in 1810. So he's a significant figure. Um, in fact, Georgia becomes so appealing for him. It's, it's, um, and it's a place where he can sort of deal with the coming of Marshall's biography. He actually spends an entire year in Georgia um, and Augusta, sort of where he, where he settles down and becomes enormously popular. I think sort of a local celebrity there and it's there that he publishes the first great revision of the life of Washington. Um, the in, um, in 1806, the um, the edition that includes the stories of Washington's childhood, the the the, the story of the cherry tree there. Um, so Weems is spending a lot of this decade going around talking about Washington, and sort of thinking about how he can make this story about who Washington is and something that excites people and attracts customers there. Um, so, so for another story, the story of George Washington praying in the woods of, at Valley Forge, uh, uh, first appeals in a newspaper, um, and a story that, that Weems has published to, um, 
to encourage people to buy Marshall's biography. So this is right there. So um, now, unfortunately for Weems, um, this, even though he has this enormous kind of success in figuring out how to do things, this is a this Marshall's biography becomes sort of disappointing. Um, the the new publisher is not doesn't really have the ability, the skills, the 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 creativity to follow Weems's advice. Um, um, Marshall's book turns out to be kind of a um, really unappealing kind of book. Um, five full volumes there. Do I have a there? That's five full volumes of things. Actually, um, Washington doesn't even appear in the first volume until like the last couple of pages there. Um, he decided he's going to write an introductory volume and he spent 500 pages writing about the early history of America. So, um, and, it's, and it's not that readable anyway. It's virtually uh, deeply sort of unappealing and Marshall knew that as well. So I'm not, I'm not slagging on Marshall either there. Um, um, and so as a result, what, what happens when, when this book is almost finished is that Washington returns to Kerry um, saying, I am um, recognizing that he's become much more mature. He, he in this wonderful phrase, he compares himself to a newly hatched, hatched chick. He said, I candidly own that I started with the eggshell of inexperience on my head. So, um, and by this time he's become an active writer. He has published another biography, um, uh, The Life of Francis Marion, which single-handedly makes Marion into this um, great, um, significant revolutionary figure, um, a historical novel, perhaps if, um, Perhaps Weems may have been the first person to use that phrase even there. The, um, and, and even those new books are selling rapidly, but The Life of Washington is becoming enor has remained enormously successful. And he tells Kerry later that even just the, the biography of Washington had been enough to support himself and his family. So he is coming to this back to Kerry with, with this new kind of um, ability to do things. Kerry had enormous success, particularly publishing um, in Expects of Bibles, something that Weems had begged him to do. It said, please, you've got to do this um, there. And so, and so they are able to come together, fall of 1808, resuming their partnership. Um, and Weems actually sells the copyright of Washington to Kerry. Um, sort of making their making their destinies sort of fit together. Carrie gives them actually a thousand dollars for that two years of wages for a skilled artisan, recognizing how how significant it is. Um, and here's a subscription page um, for the Life of Washington, which Carrie gets out there. Um, here is a later 1819 edition um, there as well. So it's a um, sort of thing and and. And Weems goes on to a long career, 15 more years, 16, 17 more years of continued writing, um, important biographies, continued traveling, um, and of course, with undiminished enthusiasm. In 1809, he's come back to work with Carey, and he says, it's an extraordinary figure. This man is able to sort of dash off these letters of, with enormous verve. He said, I am chock full of zeal. I am burning with the book fever, and so are you. An extraordinary kind of thing. So I see we're um, we're sort of heading toward the end here. So I'm I'm going to have to. Um, if you have questions about why I think this is such an important book, you're going to have to ask them there. Um, um, and otherwise, you have to wait a few years before the book is finished. So uh, so thanks very much. And I'm going to turn things over to Will, I guess. And I'll I'll stop sharing, I guess. Right, Will? That's right. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for giving us a, a preview of the coming attractions there. Um, I guess I'm going to telegraph Jim Green with my question, and I encourage all of you to jump in there, use the Q&A feature while I'm posing this. And as we're thinking about the different editions, um, by my count, uh, when you were rattling off the numbers from the different decades, 51 editions through the 1950s, does that sound right? Through the 1850s? Uh, you know, more than, more than one a year sort of yeah. Up yeah. Till, so, up till then, yeah. And I mean, what, what, what I find remarkable about that is that they seem like they're substantively different from previous editions. You're noting that the titles are changing, the content is changing. 
And what I'm curious to hear about is um, how is it expanding or contracting? And do you think it's in response to the vicissitudes of the marketplace? Or is it actually something where like Leaves of Grass, you know, another book that, that underwent a, a long evolution over the course of its lifespan, uh, really comes to encompass all of this other material that uh, Weems winds up coming into contact and just feels like he wants to integrate. So maybe I could ask you to just talk a little bit about how it shifts over time in terms of that publication history. Sure, and that's a, that's a really interesting question. And, 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 I, and I maybe should have made clear that uh, Weems stops in 1809. So it's really, that, it's really a decade of, of rewriting. And then he stops uh, when he sells the copyright to Carey. Um, he stops doing it. Um, and I sort of assumed that Carrie didn't want him to do it, but it turns out when you read the letters carefully that um, Weems says, oh, I wish I had sold it. And I wish this could be improved. And, he, and, you know, there's so much more to do. I could, I could make it, I could make it more appealing as a writer. There are lots more anecdotes that I could, I could tell. There's more chapters to be written. So he has in mind sort of things, not really clear what it is. Carrie actually says, sure, I'll pay you, well, you know, a substantial sum per page even. Um, but Weems is, you know, Weems is engaged in selling books. He is this uh, this traveler. And I think it's sort of easy to, for him at that point to sort of say, okay, it's finished. And, um, but I think, I think partly he's just, he's practicing. He's practicing talking about Washington he is he is selling remember he's selling the book himself too so it's personal to him and he's saying you know here's here's this book here's why i should care about washington um and so it's so sort of surprising when you when you get to the 1806 which is the greatest the biggest change where you have where you have this these stories of washington the cherry tree the his father um, teaching about sharing is teaching about uh, about god as well the um, you know, this appears almost sort of fully formed. Hmm. It's not like it's, it's not like he takes three more years to make, improve it. You know, there are some small changes, but nothing like, you know, you, you know, any, any revision I've ever made, it's sort of almost there. So I think he's, I think he's practicing it. He's, um, he is, um, he is speaking to people day after day after day. He is, he is actually um, when when he would go to go to stay at the house of a, a significant figure in the town, um, and what he would do, according to the um, the bishop, the Episcopal bishop of of Virginia, who did not like Weems very much, um, um, Weems would actually gather together the servants, the the, the slaves, the um, the hired people, af in the evening, and would speak to them, hmm. um, and not sort of you know, do your duty kind of thing in the, um, although I'm sure that would have been sort of thing, but, um, you know, in a deeply appealing kind of way, because the bishop, bishop, bishop was so angry about this. He says, you know, those, those people were laughing all the time. They were laughing. This Weems, you know, Weems is a, Weems is a humorist. Hmm. So, so he is talking all the time. He has this enormous clear sense of what the, uh, the, the market is. So I think that's, that's sort of what I see him doing. Um, so he wants to sell books and he also wants to, he also wants to do good. So I think it's those two things which sort of work together for him. Hmm. So we have um, a couple of questions here from uh, a real bibliophile, uh, David Koslow. Uh, who asks, are there records showing the influence on the pro style of Weems of, on other biographers or of other biographers, such as James Boswell, Life of Samuel Johnson, and other historians such as Edward Gibbon on the Roman Empire? As a book dealer, whose works did he sell? Ah, well, that's a great question. And I wish that I, I wish I had a great sort of thing. The, um, you know, Weems is usually seen, as I said, as a as a sort of, as a sort of small time peddler, carrying around books and doing that. Um, what I found is that, is that Weems gets along quite well with, with educated people and with, 
um, and with people who are intellectually kind of engaged and involved there. So um, he's selling books to to Thomas Jefferson. They um, they um, they engage in his correspondence for a while. The um, talk. Car you know, Weems talks about him as, as my friend. I'm going to go see my friend. And who knows with Weems, who is a very, um, but, but he does. Um, so Henry Lee, the, you know, the first in war, first in peace, um, actually writes this unsolicited kind of blurb for the, for the book. Um, the U. Henry Brackenridge, the, um, the Western Pennsylvania, originally Western Pennsylvania, novelist and writer, um, um, says kind of extraordinary things about the book. Um, so it's surprising how many, how many sort of people who are engaged in that literary world are doing that. I think that Carrie, um, Carrie, that Weems is, is engaged with the intellectual world of the time. And, um, you know, um, Gary Wills, the, the great, um, historian, journalist and classical scholar actually, you know, points said, you know, look, Look at look at this thing. This is Weems, you know, channeling Homer, the story of of backwoods America, um, and um, and I I was looking up something. I thought this is here's a very strange kind of term, and it turns out he's that Weems is quoting from Cicero. So he is he is not a backwoods sort of guy. Um, um, in fact, um, this is not quite on the thing, but actually Gary Wills who. Um, I think is often deeply insightful um, suggests that um, that Weems's letters are the great are the great work of Weems. They are the, they're his masterpiece, and he says they're they are like they are like Boswell's journals. They're like um, Horace Walpole's letters. They you know they give this deep sense of a of a real living human being. So, so I'm going to try to roll together David's next two questions. Forgive me, David, if I uh, do injustice to it, but he introduces Moses Pollock, a Jewish American publisher and the first bookseller in the U.S. who dealt exclusively in rare books. Apparently at the time of his death, he was one of the oldest bibli, or he was the oldest bibliophile in the country. His question is, do you know if Pollock sold books published or authored by Weems and or Carey? Wow, I wish I did because it's you know, this sounds it sounds wonderful. When when was he when was he from? Uh, uh, he lived from uh, and I'm I'm just going off of the wonderful context that David's provided. May fourteenth, eighteen seventeen to August sixteenth, nineteen oh three. Wow, oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think by the by the late nineteenth century, well, I think the book has a little bit less kind of you know, kind of standing. Um, I think even by the 1850s or so, it, um, it's sort of often sort of classified as a little more children's as a boy's book. Um, so I don't know about, you know, the, the, um, the great sort of Washington collector, Baker, what's it for his first name, sort of WS or something there is, you know, you know, clearly collected a bunch of bunch of um, Weems books, which, which is one reason why the library company has so many. So many it has one of the largest collections of things. Um, and thank goodness the the other one is um, the American Antiquarian Society, which is sort of my my home base. This is more convenient for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I've, I've never chosen anything that, that worked well with where I've been before, but maybe this works. So. Jerry A. Um, brings us back to the cherry tree. Uh, he asks, do we know where Weems heard the story of the cherry tree? Was it introduced in the 1806 edition because Weems just learned it or because the prior edition had no childhood stories? Oh, no, that's, really, that's a really significant question because you know, we don't know. Um, and there's no independent evidence that that, that actually was true. Uh, Weems spends a lot of time setting it up suggest it came from this person and he um, he says I learned it from a woman who, who when she was a little girl when Washington was a little girl you know maybe even lived in the family or lived lived almost next door so um, so he does suggest um, and it's kind of ironic that that story about truth is now seen by many people as sort of a lie and, and I'll say 
you know, it's quite possible we've made it up. You know, I think, I think that um, the next story in the, in the chapter, uh, there's sort of three great sort of large full scale stories. The next chapter is, I think, pretty clearly taken from a book um, where a guy in Scotland, you know, a number of years after Washington was a child, said, I did this to my child. So the chances of that, you know, on the other hand, you know, I've, I've never fully understood why, well, I sort of understand, but I've never, I've never accepted the idea that, that this, we know this to be absolutely false. Um, you know, in many ways, it's, it's kind of shocking how ordinary a story it is. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a boy, it's a five, six year old boy who does something wrong and tells his father he did it. It's not a, um, it's not an, it's not an extraordinarily um, distinctive kind of thing. I think people usually hear, I cannot tell a lie as being, ha, you know, what a great guy I am. And I don't think there's any reason to see it in that way. Um, but what Weems does is he makes it in this amazing sort of story. Weems is this great storyteller. It's, you know, it's, it's a number of, he breaks it up into a number of scenes where you have the, the little boy playing by himself, you know, not really paying attention to what he's doing, hurting the cherry tree. And then you go to the, you go to the, the father who is, sees this and is outraged and angry. And he's, you know, that was my favorite tree. And I was like, when something bad happens to something you own, it's your favorite ever. You can imagine ever living about it. And he goes on about this and he asks everybody. And then, and then little George comes in and what does he have in his hand? Of course, just like my Simpsons guy, he's got a little edge tool with him. And his father says, did you do this? And he, and little George kind of is taken aback and kind of is thrown by it. And then he's, then he says, well, I have to tell the truth. You know, I did it. And, and what makes the story so great that I think gets lost even in the 19th century later on is that, um, is that Weems's father, who had told Washington, the young Washington, just before this, just before Weems tells the story, he talks about uh, Father Washington telling little George, if you do something wrong, tell me the truth and I'll honor you for it. And that's what the father does. He says, run to my arms was said this is an act of heroism so to me that's the that's where the you know the emotional wallop of the story is really the you know the it's a, it's about good parenting and weems in fact right before then says um weems has father washington say you know many parents you know compel their children to lie because when the children tell the truth they beat them for doing bad things hmm. that's stupid so so that's, that's, that's my take on the cherry tree story. So I'm, I'm realizing that we have uh, six questions in queue, which is a testament to how wonderful our audience is. So I'm gonna give um, three folks one question each. I'm sorry, David and Brett, we won't get to all of your questions. So I'm gonna have a question first from Brett, then from David, and then finally from uh, Randall. All right, so this is, this, is, this is like our lightning hour here. Right. Here. I've not gone quickly in any way. <laughs> so um, Brett Bennett uh, asks if you'll talk a little bit about the, um, uh, your views on the impact Weems had on the nation's citizens uh, and how they viewed Washington. Ah, well, you know, I think he shapes a huge, a huge percentage of that. That was actually um, one of the things which you might have heard if I hadn't been so long-winded, um, is the, in, the, in the 1840s, this, this, this periodical author says, you know, the only thing children know these days about Washington is, you know, when he was young, he chopped the cherry tree, and when he was old, he beat the British. So it's, you know, it's the, and, and, I've, and I've said maybe the book has less sort of significance um, even though it still continues to sell, it's still sort of staple of things. Um, but the story of the cherry tree becomes all over the place in the late, in the late 1800s. So it is, you know, this is this is what makes the makes Washington, you know, a 19th century hero rather than the great sort of marble figure, the man who just famously can't be read because he's so taciturn and very careful about his reputation. 
Now you have the guy that young women love to look over during church service because um, they're they find the minister so cold and uninteresting that they look over at George Washington and and they and they kind of get a and they kind of have a sense of what of what religious worship is about. So probably something more going on, and frankly, if that's <laughs> that way. But all right, our our uh, lightning round continues with Randall Kleiser, who says um, or who observes that Weems travels were mostly in the South or at least south of Philadelphia, rather than deciding to go to New York and New England. Was this because Weems thought that Washington was more popular in the South or because Weems had more connections south of Philadelphia? It's a really good observation, really good. Um, he, he does some New Jersey sort of things. He goes to New York once and <laughs> has such a disaster of a time that he never goes again. Um, I think it's. I think it's just that he has those connections. I guess originally when he starts traveling further, when he when he gets to the point in the eighteen aughts when he was selling the Marshall biography, as I said, there are two salespersons, two salespeople, and Weems is tasked with doing the South. There's another person who does the North. So, um, which in many ways is an easier. Um, easier thing because it's less, much more compact. You know, Washington, you know, Weems has, you know, ha has half the, half the population probably or so. Yet he has to go, you know, all the way to Georgia to get to reach people. All right. So last question goes to David Coslow, um, who asked: Children's books were big sellers in the in 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 the nineteenth century. Was the Life of Washington sold as a children's book? Ah, ah. I think it was, although I, you know, I think people read it. It's, it's a, you know, it's one of those books that adults read and children read, and and so adults sort of hold on to it and hand it, give it to their children in that that way. But it's, it's quite, you know, quite definitely seen as a children's book and um, seen as a boy's book, as a matter of fact. Um, which I have found, you know, a number of women, young women, reading it, um, um, but sort of boys are seen as the sort of key figure there. So it's, um, it's marketed as well as a school book. So it's, you know, it's this, it's this kind of blockbuster sort of thing. It crosses all sorts of, sorts of boundaries there. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Um, I'm going to adjourn there because uh, I take uh, undue satisfaction from completing these on time. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing this project with us, Steve. I can't wait for the book. And we have to figure out a way to get you back in the library company when we're reopened. Really look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for coming, everybody, all of you that I can't see, that I, that I know you have such good questions. And I would love to talk more. But let's hope we get a chance to do so. And let's hope we all get a chance to meet in person someday. So. Uh, absolutely. And um, if if I were interested in continuing the conversation, looking ahead to next week, your colleague Seth Perry is on deck, uh, and he'll be talking about America's first celebrity preacher and how he perfected the Protestant art of talking about yourself. Um, again, same time, same place, your living room, uh, and I hope all of you can join us again. Thank you so much. <laughs>